Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and in this episode, I have something special for you. I have three guests on. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Uh, we have uh, Zoe Kirkos, Sarah Studdard, and Kyle Wagenschutz. Sarah and Kyle have been on the podcast uh, before, and together they have recently formed a new nonprofit, City Thread, stitching together the fabric of our communities. A community based approach to engaging diverse populations so that cities can see projects through to fruition. I hope you enjoy this episode. I am so delighted to uh, welcome to the podcast some good friends from City Thread, uh, Sarah, Zoe, and Kyle. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks. Glad to be back. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what I'd like to do to just kind of get us started is have each of you sort of introduce yourself. So Sarah, uh, kick us off. Thanks, John. Yeah, happy to be back. I am Sarah Studdard. I am a communications and community engagement professional. I've been working in communities for over 15 years, really ensuring that residents have a voice in changes to their public spaces or the systems um, that they utilize, whether that's a food system or an economic development program. And also really believe that not only uh, should residents have that input, but we should be telling the stories of success as well as challenges in our communities locally. Um, and I'm happy to be a partner here at City Thread, where we are also continuing to ensure that we are grounding our, our programs and, and services that we'll talk more on in an equitable and inclusive way that value people and their communities. That's fantastic. It's great. Uh, now, I should have mentioned that that you all are, are located in uh, the Denver metro area. Uh, Sarah, where are you originally from? That's a hard, that's a question that has a long answer, John, but I'll keep it short. I grew up moving around, so I've lived on the East Coast and the Midwest. I The longest place that I've ever lived is Memphis, Tennessee, where I lived there for a decade before moving to Denver, where I am tuning in from. So Memphis is home. They may not accept me as that, but that's it. Okay, so Memphis is home. Okay. Yes, Got but I live Excellent. in Denver. But you're, but you're in Denver, <laughs> yeah. And, and you're ingesting, and, and, and I know because we follow each other on social media, I know that you're enjoying the mountains, Rocky Mountains, and you're getting out, and, and, and so you're getting the whole experience of what it means to live in Colorado. So, great. Well, hey, Zoe, you're up next. Uh, who is Zoe? <laughs> oh, who is Zoe? Thanks so much, John, for having us on. Um, so I'm Zoe Kirkus, delighted to be a partner at SETI Thread along with Sarah and Kyle. Um, my background is in nonprofit organizations going back 20 plus plus years, um, working primarily, primarily in fundraising and development as both a, a grant uh, writer, you know, securing funding from organi from foundations and philanthropic organizations to uh, su support community-based work and also as a grant maker. So I've also um, given out funding uh, for different kinds of projects. So I uh, pull in the money and I give out the money. That's my favorite thing. So uh, I have worked in a variety of areas in the nonprofit field, but for the last last uh, 11 plus years have been in the mobility space. Um, I worked at uh, People for Bikes, a national bicycling organization for a number of years, um, uh, working on those community partnerships that Sarah described on large grant funded uh, collaborations, uh, primarily around trying to help people get access to uh, the mobility options that make their lives easier. We all have to get somewhere most times, most days of the week. And uh, the more options we have for doing that in a safe and accessible and affordable way, um, the better our lives and our communities. So I've been working on that. And I'm just happy to be here and, and a partner uh, to these great folks. Fantastic. And are you a Colorado native? No, I'm not. I live now in Boulder, Colorado, and I've been here close to 30 years. Ah! Uh, but wow. I am originally from uh, Michigan. I grew up in Detroit until I was 12 and then in the Detroit suburbs um, through college. So okay. uh, definitely very familiar with uh, a car centric environment. <laughs> Well, we, we have some common uh, you know territory. I, I did my graduate work at the University of Michigan in in Ann Arbor. Go blue. Go yeah. blue. Okay, excellent. <laughs> and, uh, and and yeah, I, I 
I spent a decade living in Boulder, so uh, and and that's really what I call my my adopted home. I, I feel like my heart is still there in Boulder. <laughs> Anytime you want to come back, John. I, well, I you're try welcome. to come back frequently, so I will see you. <laughs> All right, Kyle, you're up. Hey, John, glad to be be back on the podcast and hello to everyone. I'm Kyle Wagonshoots. Uh, like Sarah, I kind of lived everywhere growing up, moving around quite a bit, but I call Memphis, Tennessee home. It's actually where Sarah and I met. Uh, and I lived in Memphis for about 20 years. And while I was there, I was a uh, advocate. Uh, I worked in regional government. I worked in local government. Uh, I worked at state level advocacy, local advocacy, and sort of a jack of all trades for, you know, advocating for safe and active mobility options for people. And today, I would say that I'm a I'm a recovering bureaucrat. I worked. I did my time in government and learned. Uh, all of the ways that uh, government is and isn't working for um, people on the ground. And just you know, for the last few years, Sarah and I have really been working at trying to build new ways of helping communities do good things um, and not get stuck in the red tape that, that keeps those good things, you know, parks, bike lanes, trails, sidewalks from actually hitting the ground. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So what I'd like to do uh, to sort of kick us off is is talk a little bit about City Thread and, um, and the organization itself. And the first thing I want to address is ha- or have uh, I'll let you guys th- you know roll the dice to figure out who wants to to give the story behind the name. But uh, the story behind the name City Thread. Well, I'll I'll kick us off. Uh, naming an organization is even harder than naming your children, I'll, I'll just say, especially when you have three people in the mix instead of just two. So we just started off with a whole bunch of words, everything that kind of could come to mind with the theme of, you know, working in communities and connecting communities. And so um, we also, a number of us have kind of that craftiness side to us. So kind of the fabric arts was sort of uh, uh, included a lot of words that we gravitated to. And we just just put them together in different ways and then started Googling to see if they had social media followings, if there were other organizations that had that name um, uh, to see, you know, what would fly. And from that, and then we all went out and asked our friends and family and neighbors and random people we encountered on the streets what they thought of our top three and came up with City Thread. I love it. I love it. And what I really love about it is how much more sense it makes when I see the, the the tagline here, stitching together the fabric of our communities. And then I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, I obviously it's you're absolutely right. It's 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 a challenge always naming an organization, a new organization. And uh, I can remember when I, I first, you know, launched the Active Towns uh, initiative. And I'm like, you know, active cities, active communities. What it really came down to was the URL was available. <laughs> I was like, okay, activetowns.org is available. Cool. My next call was to, to Chuck Marone at Strong Towns and said, are you okay with that? It's, they're kind of close. So anyways, okay, that's awesome. I love it. That's, that's super exciting. And um, when we look at what you all are, are trying to do and the, and, and the name and how you're talking about trying to stitch together the fabric of our communities. Um, what's the, what's the elevator pitch in terms of, uh, you know, what that's all about, you know, who, who's, who's got the right off the top, you know, ready to go, the elevator pitch of, of city threat. Kyle wagon shoots has that. Kyle, <laughs> Excellent. John, I, you know, I think the three of us have decades of experience trying to work in communities who are, who's ever, who are trying to get things built. They're trying to build a bicycle lane. They're trying to build a pop-up park. They are trying to get a farmer's market going. They are, you know, they're looking at funding libraries, community resource centers. There's, there's all these community groups who have a lot of great intentions and are really sort of thinking about tackling these problems but through, but through a very sort of engineering, planning, funding, you know, that sort of focus. And I think what we realized after, you know, working in communities is that really the secret sauce for 
communities being able to do good things is the connections that people make to one another. And ultimately, all this, all of these projects or infrastructure or place-based programs that are trying to be implemented are also trying to bring people together. And, and so our, our approach is really around sort of thinking about partnerships in new ways, building coalitions in new ways, bringing people together, because the, the people are the fabric of the community. And too often, uh, you know, the barriers that prevent us from, you know, making, you know, making progress on these things that benefit all residents of our community are actually that we, we've, we're missing some sort of connection between people. We're either missing a common motivation, we're missing, uh, you know, just meeting new people. And, and so City Thread is really around helping communities achieve their goals, but doing it in a way that builds, uh, builds coalitions of unlikely partners, builds coalitions of new partners, and helps strengthen, you know, that very fabric of the community so that, at the end of the day, when they build the thing that they wanted to build, they're all able to enjoy it together. They're all able to take pride in the successful accomplishment of that. And hopefully those partnerships and, and coalitions go on to do bigger and better things after that. Right. So when you talk about doing it from a, a different approach, um, how does that really manifest itself? Well, we know, and I'm sure, John, you've experienced this as well as the folks tuning in, is that not only does it take too long for cities to complete projects that benefit residents, but also that really all, all stakeholders, all people and communities face a lot of challenges. Elected officials are, are working on reducing uh, global warming and fighting climate change, affordable housing, um, you know, closing gaps between general wealth, generational wealth, um, and, you know, kind of trickles down to the, the city staff that helps support and implement the policies and, and build the, the sort of infrastructure, whether that's streets or an affordable housing uh, building to support that. And then residents, you know, also have challenges. And on July 7th, uh, 2022, I think we can all kind of take a moment of grace that a lot of bad things are happening in the world. And um, what if kind of looking out our front door, our front window could be a positive piece. And so what we do differently is that we really, we work with those three partners. Um, we call them the stool, elected leaders, city staff and community partners to build trust, increase capacity and achieve broad support for projects that, you know, kind of, overwhelmingly benefit people and the place that they live, work, and play. And so we identify the right mix of partners, and we really ensure that all partners at the table um, are fed. They're provided the resources they need to have the time and space to collaborate across partnerships like a mayor and a community partner that maybe was never done before or maybe was done in the past and had challenges and maybe the end result wasn't what um, the original partnership desired. And so we really focus on, you know, working with that diverse team of stakeholders, identifying the problem they want to solve. Um, you know, for us right now, we recently came, up, came off of success with accelerating mobility and complete bike network projects, but really creating um, diverse coalitions locally that can work with our elected leaders and city staff to really make change um, faster than it's done before. Yeah. So out on your website, uh, you know, the, there's these four quadrants that you, that you have out there. And some of the things that you had just said, uh, Sarah and, and, and also Kyle, uh, you know, touched upon these of, of, you know, meeting you know, clients where they are. And when I think back to the cities that you all have been working with over the years, they're very different places. <laughs> so, you know, obviously the the, the environment in, uh, in Austin, Texas is much, much different than Providence, Rhode Island. Talk a little bit about this, this concept that you're, you're, you know, uh, addressing here in terms of the solve and support. 
I think what, you know, what one area to sort of understand in working with cities is that there's a big spectrum of where cities are today. And what tends, what tends to happen is that what we read in the media, what we hear about on amazing podcasts like this one are the best case examples or the trending solution or the trending innovation. And, and so what, what's happening is we have cities across the country who, who are starting from very different places, radically different places in some places. And what, we're, what they're being fed in terms of best practice, the things they should be aspiring to are all world-class examples. And there's a gulf between where a community might be starting and how they can reach to achieve that world-class example. And so what, what we've made a practice of, and I think what, what we'll continue to do at City Thread is understand that we know where we all want to get. We all want to get to the world-class examples, but we've got to learn to walk before we run. And a lot of places are still crawling today, John. And I think, I think that's what this is really sort of trying to convey is that our understanding is not to convince cities that they can go straight from a crawl to a sprint out of the gate, that there's a, there's a couple steps in between that, that you've got to sort of foundationally do in order to sort of for, to take those big steps. And we, we sort of have mentioned this. Some of those foundational steps are building a strong coalition of partners that are working on the same goal. And we can't, we can't overstate how important that actually is to the end result that we're trying to get. Um, you know, there's examples from communities where there's been a couple really great partners. They can make, they can make, they can build some momentum, make some progress in a short period of time, but it oftentimes isn't sustainable because there's just, there's, there's not the momentum there. There's not the strength in that kind of work to sort of see it through for a long period of time. And so there's, there's a lot of history of communities doing really great things for, you know, one mayoral administration. And then that, that, that mayor doesn't run for re-election, a new mayor comes in and all progress stops. There's a really, there's really great examples of, uh, you know, amazing advocacy groups, you know, flourishing at their moment in time and making some really significant policy um, changes. But, you know, over time, the, the efficacy of those advocacy groups can, can wane and fall with the political tides that happen. And so, you know, you sort of see these fits and starts and what, we're, what City Thread is saying is that we think that there's a more sustainable way if communities are willing to, at the very front, prioritize, you know, diversity of partnerships, strength of coalition, and then the identification of what a long-term shared goal would be for those groups. Right. Yeah. Sliding over, you know, one of the, the biggest things that... Uh, uh, I noticed in following these projects over the years was this emphasis on <laughs> trying to break the log jam. You know, Kyle, you had mentioned it earlier, your experience, uh, you know, at the city level and things just going super slow. So actually trying to break that log jam, accelerate, get stuff on the ground and deliver. Uh, Sarah, when you think of, uh, of the past few years and, and, and the work that you all have been doing, um, and, 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 and Zoe, you know, the same thing here, you know, cause the, I, I see that, you know, the ability to fundraise and be, get creative of getting resources available to accelerate and to deliver. Talk a little bit about, you know, that, and, and I'll let you guys flip the coin between Zoe and uh, Sarah in terms of who wants to talk to, to that. We both can. So I'll start and then would love for Zoe to share her um, amazing expertise on, you know, the fundraising and, you know, supporting folks locally. So, you know, the Accelerate and Deliver, this proven playbook that we mentioned, this comes from work that Kyle and I led when we were um, working at People for Bikes. We had the opportunity to lead a program that was a partnership between People for Bikes and WEND Collective. And this program wanted to really answer a question that um, a lot of our friends, colleagues, stakeholders had been having, which is, why does it take so long? Like, the simple question that we've mentioned a few times, it is a theme. Um, and so we really took three years in five US cities, Austin, Denver, New Orleans, Pittsburgh, and Providence to see if we could 
build complete, safe, high quality, comfortable, and convenient places for people to ride bikes, drive cars, take transit, walk, et cetera, um, in record time. And we are still super pleased to say that we were able to do that. Um, all five of those cities collectively constructed 335 miles, 335 miles collectively um, in just 24 months. Right. And they are now all on pace to fully complete their planned networks 25 years earlier than expected. Um, you know, Austin will by 2025 through not only building over 100 miles in two years, but through passing um, kind of an amazing transit bond that's connected to further bike network infrastructure. By 2025, they'll have fully built out their planned bike network. Um, they are investing more money and have more ambitious goals than Paris from a mobility network perspective. And they also get to like take a plan and put it on the shelf or, I don't know, burn it in memoriam, which I don't know if any U.S. city has had the opportunity to fully complete a plan to date. Um, and kind of, you know, we've talked a little bit about the how, which is rooting this accelerating and deliver in diverse coalitions. But it, it really is, you know, our, our playbook pushes directly against from the beginning the status quo of, of advocacy, particularly bike advocacy. And it works from a perspective that we need a complete network of bike lanes, sidewalks, just as we have a complete network of roads. And we need to invest in those, but we also need to understand that, you know, there are people that may never ever ride a bike and that's okay. And we, as messengers for mobility, need to, and we do have, a more um, successful message or value proposition that a protected bike lane will make your life easier, safer, more convenient, regardless if you never choose to bike at all. And so we center a protected bike lane in the same way we could center um, a public park or a farmer's market is that it has an amazing benefit to all of the residents that live in that community. Um, and I'll just pause there and turn it over to Zoe. Yeah, Zoe, go ahead. A couple of things, um, because you raise the issue of funding. And I think having worked um, in philanthropy and with uh, foundations for a long time, I think transportation is really intimidating and complicated. We know it contributes significantly to climate issues. We know it's an issue, you know, if you are a funder that you are engaged in, in addressing climate issues, you really should have be engaged in transportation because it's probably one of the or the biggest contributor, right? But it feels very big and complicated. And how do you put funding towards this in a way that's meaningful and effective? Um, but what we've seen in city and that uh, cities and that both Kyle and, and Sarah have, have alluded to is that um, cities actually can move fast and, and funding, I'm not saying funding is not a big issue, but it hasn't in our experience, been the primary barrier. It hasn't been, I mean, every city is poor when it comes to doing big things, and yet they can find funding for these infrastructure projects with the proper, you know, um, uh, ambition and vision and uh, community support and political leadership. Like it, it can be found and it doesn't it isn't all coming from the federal government. You know, people are pointing to the infrastructure bill, which is awesome and amazing. But the five cities that we've been talking about did not do all this work with federal money. They did it with local money. And Austin is another great example of it with the um, the ballot initiatives that you were you were discussing. So um, we think that uh, targeted investment by funders in this can affect huge change. And I think there's great opportunity for that. I also uh, think in the ways that, you know, Sarah talked about when you and Kyle, too, when you when you bring coalitions of people together, you can activate around more issues than just mobility. Mobility is something that we all experience um, challenges with and opportunities and need for. Um, and when we come together around something that ties us together, we can also see opportunities to come together around other things like that farmer's market that Kyle uh, mentioned, like that um, playground, like that uh, affordable housing developments. So 
Um, I, I just think that we have a lot of opportunities here and there are opportunities to solve a lot of the issues that are in front of us. And mobility is the one that we kind of center our conversation around because it's what we're most, most familiar with. But we also have opportunities in other places, too, that people coming together can really affect change in a lot of different places. And I think philanthropy is a really big, important part of that. Yeah. I would just add that you know, City Thread is a nonprofit, and we made that decision to be a nonprofit, understanding that traditional philanthropy, large foundations that do giving um, have policies in place to fund directly to a 501c3. And we would like to see ourselves and, and have in the past and will in the future to help not have that be a barrier for community partners to receive funding and to really ensure that, you know, the fundraising that we may support can also be, you know, directly um, be given directly back locally to the community partners that need th that support, but may not have the institutional infrastructure to support to support that. Yeah. I wanted to get to the other four uh, or the other two uh, things to this quadrant of things. And, and you just you, you mentioned this and, and uh, Sarah, is that a big part of this is in and in, in what you're seeing in the, the challenge that we have with these cities isn't necessarily uh, the, the funding, Zoe, as you pointed out, of of actually. Uh, you know, accessing those federal dollars, building that infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, there, there may be, you know, issues of me needing to raise those funds, but specifically the ability to, um, you know, do some of these creative engagement strategies. And that's the sweet spot of what you guys are doing and it's this activation and engagement aspect of of how you're, you're you're pulling together and that's how you're able to work across very very different types of cities because you're not raising money of capital funds to build infrastructure you're actually doing something even more important in my mind in the sense that you're helping to educate and engage communities kyle talk about what this part of it and why this is so powerful. Yeah. John, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head there. There are a number of challenges that arise within cities that are solvable problems that we think are solvable problems, design, planning, engineering, you know, how wide should this lane be compared to this lane? How are we going to pay for it? It's not that those are obstacles. Those are the obstacles to getting projects done. Those are questions that need to be answered, but they are not the primary obstacles that, that are preventing cities from moving faster. And from our experience, both working locally in communities, you know, in our past, and then also our experience working with other communities, you know, the the absolute biggest number one issue facing every community is public engagement and the public dialogue that happens around these projects. You know, both both from a public media perspective, the kinds of internal communications that supporters and opposition put out, and then what happens organically on the ground uh, working in communities. We, Sarah and I talked about this Probably, John, the last time we were on the podcast, because we were we were really deep into sort of some of the messaging and communications research that we were that we were leading at the time. And even uh, John, you'll know this that Sarah and I had a podcast called the Bike Nerds Podcast. And we even dove deeper on this with with some with bring some back experts. the nerds, bring back the nerds. <laughs> <laughs> but but at the end of the day, our, our, the way that cities and advocates and champions for this kind of work communicate. Uh, uh, the benefits to this work, communicate in a way that builds support for it, is fundamentally broken. This is this is what sort of Sarah alluded to, where we where we think there's a real status quo within advocacy and communication that that has to be changed fundamentally, and it, and it starts with you know uh, creating communications and crafting language around this kind of work that resonates with people who are never going to show up and do the thing that you actually want to sort of see done right it's 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 communicating to people who that that who are never going to go to the farmers market but the farmers market is good for them it's about communicating to drivers uh, who are never going to get out of their car, that a bike lane is good for them. That's that's the primary audience because those are the people who, when they read about a bicycle lane in the newspaper, 
they call the mayor's office or they email their city council member or they show up to the public meeting to say, this doesn't benefit me. Why would we, why would we have this in our neighborhood? We don't, too, too, too often our communications, our messaging are crafted towards people who already get it, right? It's like, it's, it's the preaching, preaching to the choir. And I, there's a, there's a really like, I'm not sure who said this or who to attribute it to, but I, while we were doing this research, one of our um, consulting partners had this phrase that said, good messaging is not what we want to tell people. Good messaging is telling people what they want to hear consistent with who we are. And I think that's a, that's a really nuanced way to sort of think about, you know, becoming better communicators of this work is that we have to, we have to reach people fundamentally where they are and make it, and make it work for us rather than convincing them that they're wrong and that we're right and that we have a better perspective on this. And so, and so city thread, you know, a, a, a majority of the work that we're actually doing is this coalition building. But, but, it, but within that, you know, you have to sort of naturally understand what is it what does it mean to collaborate with other people how do you how do you talk to other organizations how do you find other community leaders how do you communicate with elected officials there's very nuanced ways to sort of you know to do that the strategies behind that um, um, differ and I think historically it's been approached from a very antagonistic standpoint right the way to get things done is to is to antagonize whoever is opposing this thing until they until they relent, right? Or compromise, or or delay, or decide not to do this thing. It's it's all it's all driven in this very competitive landscape. And City Thread just our fundamental belief is that it doesn't have to be competitive. We can actually all get what we want um, by working together and accomplishing much broader goals than we maybe initially set out to do. Right. Yeah. And a big part of that is is you know making sure that you're you're surveying that landscape and you know getting those coalitions together and those partners together that you need to be able to to really understand uh, and and back to the activation and engagement um, aspect of it, it it also reminds me Sarah of the work that you did previously in Memphis in uh, rolling out the bike share of how incredibly important it was to engage with uh, populations that typically didn't see that type of of you know infrastructure in those types of facilities and and really uh, that was probably the coolest thing about uh, you know that particular project of making sure that you know you, you are creating partnerships uh, and especially of those communities that aren't typically uh, seen as as being a part of the solution. Yeah, you know, in Memphis with Explore Bike Share, the nonprofit bike share organization that launched in 2018, um, you know, you you just said it, John. It was a great example of identifying through really authentic, um, not short term partnership building um, engagement with all of the community groups that were in Memphis, and identifying how those community groups wanted to see. Um, a system of bike share systems um, deployed, planned, activated in their city. And, you know, I would say in the five cities, Providence and New Orleans, you know, I'll use their example is, you know, they, those communities really leaned into um, non-traditional bike advocates. So we saw Economic Development Association in the Algiers neighborhood leading, um, really leading the local community engagement efforts um, around planning the mobility network. In Providence, uh, you know, you wouldn't see really a traditional mobility or bike advocate because Providence Streets Coalition is leading that effort, but also really leading with social and environmental justice um, type vision and goals. And I know Zoe's experience in the Better Bike Share Partnership also really showed how we really need to kind of shake off whatever sort of silo we're, we're in or whatever sort of identity we may have around whether it's a specific mode or a specific way a city should change or not change and really be inclusive of um, how we all are part of a community. 
Yeah, yeah. I want to pull up a visual here that will help uh, highlight a, a little bit of what we're talking about in terms of of how this manifested itself uh, visually. <laughs> and uh, for those of us who were were in one of the communities, I'm obviously in Austin, so I got to see a lot of the graphics uh, that were on the sides of buses and, and over, you know, uh, being sent out in social media, um, on uh, billboards even. And, uh, and so these graphics became like second nature. We were like, oh yeah, there it is, cool. And one of the, Early on, one of the the, the mantras that um, I can recall when when uh, this all sort of got launched was, you know, if if there, everybody has a piece of the road, there can be peace on the road. I might be messing that or bungling that up. Did I get that right, Kyle? <laughs> that was correct. Yeah, I mean, it's close enough. There's there's a couple of versions of it, but yeah, everyone has peace on the road when there's everyone has a piece of the road of the road and if you Which, and if you if you yeah. don't if, if you haven't said it enough um you should just keep on saying it over and over again yeah. um, because that's 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 the concept yeah well and and you got to it earlier when you, you had talked about how it's so incredibly important um to be able to communicate the values of uh these types of of programs, these types of initiatives, these types of this type of infrastructure to the broader, uh, you know, community and and being able to to you know kind of communicate. And I think that these these visuals are are each of them are, are sort of customized to the the city that they're at. The the one on the top is from uh, from Austin. The one in the middle is the Denver uh, Streets Partnership, and so that's Denver. And then the one in the bottom there is it's Pittsburgh. And, and I, I suspect we'd see somewhat similar, um, you know, from the other two cities as well, uh, in terms of the messaging. And but they're, they've been kind of customized. Even even the uh, the red uh, cycle track color of the uh, the bike lane for for Austin there. Thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> and but it, it it is communicating not so much to quote unquote the bike people. We're, we're trying, what you all have been doing with this is structuring a campaign that really resonates with a broad population. And then you also did a lot of polling of, you know, and getting a sense as to how, you know, these campaigns were being received. So really what we're talking about here is we're shaping the narrative uh, and the way people are thinking about, you know, these, am I getting that about right? Yeah, I think so, because, you know, a lot of pe different people, different users are sharing the road and nobody goes out. Like if I go out of my car, the last thing I want is to hit somebody on a bike or hit somebody walking or ca cause injury, like the absolute last thing. So uh, when I was, you know, teaching my kids to drive, the the fear that stuck with me every night that you'd wake up with is the idea, you know, the fear that your kid would hit somebody who was walking or biking when they're a novice driver. And what these um, this infrastructure does is not just create safe places for people to walk, uh, to ride scooters, to ride bicycles, to um, be in wheelchairs but it also creates a very clear space for people driving cars to operate their vehicles. So you know exactly where you belong, you know where they belong, and everybody feels safe and comfortable. And, you know, it, it creates that space because there are some people who are never going to ride a bike. And just keep keep keeping on telling them that it really is safe and comfortable and they'll really have a happier life if they ride a bike may work for a small subset, but won't work for a large subset. And so instead of trying to send that message over and over, you know, the definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Well, um, the, you know, keep painting bike lanes and keep telling people it's safe is probably not going to be, you know, um, successful. So uh, the idea that you can create, create, you know, safe spaces and honor the modes that people are choosing and yet create space on the street for all of them to use that modes is the approach that we take. Yeah. When I think of this, this challenge that these, that we have in cities of being able to um, make more livable places, oftentimes we're, 
you know, were stymied again, not by not having the money necessarily, uh, although that can be a problem, but the backlash and, 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 you know, basically community members that are, you know, feeling as if they're not being, you know, listened to and feeling as if the, this doesn't apply to them. This feels like part of the solution. Am, am I getting that right? So absolutely, I mean, not only is communicating to more people about the benefits of a complete and connected network, really the diverse coalitions ensures that the way diverse coalitions under our playbook work directly with city staff and elected official in public input processes um, pro to the planning of what that process should be to implementation. So I think a lot of folks in cities or as a resident would agree that the way cities operate public input um, due to a lot of kind of lack of resources um, doesn't really uh, make people feel heard and supported. And so we acknowledge that um, and then provide, you know, all the stakeholders a solution, which is you know, maybe in a certain neighborhood, door to door canvassing is how to ensure that you are hearing what residents want to say. Maybe it's a texting campaign um, or a simple, you know, radio ad. Um, so it's really kind of understanding exactly how residents want to be heard and being really clear around the process, which the city of Austin does a really good job at. Um, you know, you can visit the a website after a public input meeting and know exactly what city staff is doing with your feedback. And you also have a really clear understanding of when a decision has been made, why that decision has been made, you know, and it may not be the decision you're really happy about, but it followed a process that really um, focused on, you know, what's best for that community that was influenced and heard by the residents that live there. I want to go to this graphic here, and I think this we've hit upon each of these areas, but it, it really, I think, drives it home in terms of what you guys are, are actually uh, doing and how you're, you're doing it. Um, who wants to, to, to walk through just real quick, because I think we have talked uh, about each of these areas, but uh, who wants to drive it home for, for what this is all about? I'll do it, John. I was gonna, I was going to be nominated anyway, so I'll just go ahead and volunteer. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, I, I mean, if you if we look historically in any community where we where a community is rallied together to try to advance a cause, a project, a program. What you'll find is there's the, there's a typical cast of characters in every community across the country that are that are always considered to be like key stakeholders, right? You have your elected officials in whatever capacity they hold, whatever power they hold. You've got the city staff, you know, the people who are working day in and day out to deliver great results for their community, who really believe, you know, in the efficacy of government, the legitimacy of government, to to do good things for people. And then you've got a, a wide variety of community advocates, neighborhood leaders, um, you know, just people who have lived in communities for a long time who are respected. And, and fundamentally, I think at the end of the day, what we all think is that all of these individuals should be working together to achieve the same goal, right? Like they, they all kind of want the same thing. They want the place that they're living to be better tomorrow than it is today. And, you know, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But, but fundamentally, you know, these are the cast of characters who are working to make improvements to cities, whether that's delivering projects or, or, or you know, solving a problem or helping to sort of, you know, get uh, fundraise for new books at the library. There, there, there should be this real consensus building moment that gathers them all together, that, that catalyzes, you know, progress and really sort of accelerates results. But uh, oftentimes it doesn't actually work out that way, right? And you might, you might uh, have some real momentum on sort of like one of the corners of this triangle, one of the legs of the stool, um, but not in another. And, and, and so 
what we set out to do with the final mile and ultimately what city thread you know will continue to sort of you know you know use as its model for working in communities is that we have all the all of our communities have the pieces needed to achieve great things whatever that whatever that idea of a great thing is for your community whatever that idea for improvement actually is for a community the, the actors the legs of the stool the partners are there um, but oftentimes when we invite people to come to be a part of a partnership, when we invite people to come to be a part of a coalition, they're missing some sort of fundamental resource that prevents them from being the best at their job that they need to be on any given day. And, you know, what we just identified was where did those, what, what, what are the major, you know, resources, you know, what do these, what do these groups need to be, to be the best versions of themselves, to be the best versions of themselves in order to benefit the community that, that they need to be. And everybody kind of have, has different needs. What, when we looked at sort of past place-based programs in cities, federal grants, private grants, we oftentimes saw that some of those programs were intended to fill these resource gaps, to provide, you know, sort of the basic sustenance that these, these community partners needed. But they were only feeding one or two legs of the stool. They weren't, they weren't sort of simultaneously feeding uh, and, and helping to resource all of the partners simultaneously. And what these partners need are actually very different from one another, right? You know, fundamentally, community advocates at the end of the day they need operating support. They need to know that for all of their effort, for, for their organization, for their representation, or for themselves individually, that, that, they, that they can sustain you know, uh, paying their bills uh, to be a part of this coalition. City staff a lot of times need technical help. We need, we, need, we need more capacity to design more things, to finish our engineering, to tackle these big funding and design challenges that we have. And elected leaders really need to be fed a constant stream of support, positive accolades, you know, for uh, the, the leadership that they're showing. They need to understand where the public sentiment is actually at. And so what, what we attempt to do is to, in any individual community, identify who these partners actually are, invite them to be a part of a process where uh, they work to develop a shared goal for their community. And identify what do they need to continue to be a part of this process day in and day out for a couple of years. And that's and then City Thread steps in, uses our philanthropic partners to help fill the resource gaps specifically to each of those partners. So, so now, now you've got this three-legged stool and it's bound together by the support that philanthropy is bringing. And no stool is shorter than the others. No stool is weaker than the others. All of the stools are there and they all get to work towards the common goal. It's a little, it's a little kumbaya at the end of the day, right? It's not uh, your bike lane should be six feet versus five feet. Um, but that's, that's, that's the real fundamental challenge here is we're, we're not trying to identify what a better design for a bike lane actually is now. I just, I need hundreds of miles of really well-built bicycle lanes to go in instead of just one every year. Right. Yeah. And to the city leaders, from their standpoint, especially if they happen to be elected officials, they, you know, they need to feel like uh, their communities, their, you know, the the constituents that they have are are, are really interested in this and, and want to move forward. Because again, we, we hear from the haters, it's like, okay, well, what, what does the what does the data actually say after we've done this campaign and after we've done some before and after polling? Are we able to, you know, better communicate that, you know, this is something they may be silent, but the vast majority of people actually do support these types of of um, uh, projects to move forward. Now, obviously, you know, in the, in the past, uh, you were very, f you know, focused in on infrastructure related to building out uh, cycle networks. Um, and, and, and that was a very, very intentional evolution that took place, uh, you know, given the organization that you were with. Uh, originally, it was about demonstrating the uh, efficacy of building, you know, protected bikeways and high comfort bike bike facilities but then it got you know really the emphasis of the final mile was just that that final mile bridging some of those those key gaps and and the emphasis on can we build out this network um 
who would like to speak to that in terms of of you know how fundamentally important that is i think it's obvious but put a bow on it for anybody who is watching or listening that is like what's the difference between a facility and a network and why does the network matter that much i'm i'm happy to take that so for us and you know all of our experience as well as a variety of other mobility leaders you know i if i choose to drive my car i have a hundred percent confidence that when i leave my front door i will have roads and streets with probably some sort of intersections or stoplights to help me navigate to my destination and there'll be a place for me to park when I get there. Um, the concept that there are, and that is a complete road network. Um, it connects our entire country from highways to neighborhood streets. Um, and so we are saying that for the other ways people choose to get around, um, there should be a complete network that if I decide I want to walk to my grocery store, I know that there is a safe and comfortable sidewalk that with confidence I can get there safely and it is not confusing and it's not stressful. And so, you know, for, for us, it is, you need a network. It, it, it is almost impossible to imagine. And I say this with uh, the utmost respect for how kind of advocacy in our protected bike lanes got here today, that we would, you know, really assume that we would get a ton of people riding bikes if there are just individual projects. And also from a community perspective, a protected bike lane makes zero sense if you know that you never can or never will ride a bike if it is half a mile. Um, and so creating these connections to create a continuous um, continuous place for people to, to be just like we have provided for individual cars and the variety of other sort of automobile-like vehicles. Yeah, yeah. I thought it'd be fun to have a little bit of a a, a, a visual to this. <laughs> so uh, this is the example of of the before and after for for Austin, and and uh, it, it was mentioned uh, earlier that um, you know Austin is is going to be zeroing in on uh, building out the quote unquote. Uh, completing the the, the plan, um, although I like to remind uh, people frequently that a, a plan, or, you know, the network is actually never complete um, because it, as as Kyle's nodding is, as we know from the Dutch example, uh, yeah, it, it's always evolving. They're always tweaking it and they're always improving. And in fact, uh, when I look at what, especially in North America, what we considered uh, protected bikeways, you know, five years ago, we're like looking at it going, you know what, that could be done better. And so it's never really done. <laughs> maybe the lines and maybe the, 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 uh, the, the quote unquote network is, is there, but uh, don't worry, uh, folks, uh, if you're almost done with your network, you're never really done because you're going to always be improving it and 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 really trying to make it uh, reach that level of truly being an all ages and abilities facility that encourages, um, you know, everybody to, to actually be able to use it, whether, you know, you're talking about an eight year old or an 80 year old and anybody in between, uh, it, regardless of physical abilities and uh, and also all walks of life, everyone from every part of the, 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 the town from an equity perspective. Um, so this is, th these visuals are just really, really fun and exciting. Uh, this is a Shoal Creek Boulevard uh, example. Um, I do have a video that I produced from the community celebration ride from this particular facility. It's really a game changer too. And there's some really neat features to this that aren't just bike features. I mean, there's there's plenty of pedestrian crossings. There's some uh, wonderful rain gardens that have been uh, in, you know put into here. This is through a sensitive area of the Shoal Creek area. So water management, storm water management is an issue so this isn't a single subject uh you know kind of initiative or project um and with that being said kyle you said something earlier of regardless of what a city is um you know 
what their their objective is. Does that mean City Thread will will actually be able to help with other types of things other than you know bike infrastructures? You use the example of a farmer's market. If if what they really want and what that is the the thing that the 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 community needs is that something City Thread can also help a, a community with? Yeah, I, I think what we discovered in this process, John, is that the playbook of creating partners that worked well together, that they create a shared vision, resourcing them at their most fundamental needs is agnostic of what the actual outcome they're trying to achieve actually is. And so we, we had the opportunity to, to try it out and to test it using mobility networks. But if I, if I think back to my grad school days working in South Memphis, helping create a uh, revitalization plan for the neighborhood, these are the same tactics that we were using when we were knocking on doors, inviting community members to come down to the local church later that afternoon, you know, for a meeting to help them envision what their community could be like in the future. It's, it's, the, it's the same tactics that are being used by community organizations across the country and, and, and it doesn't kind of, it kind of doesn't matter what we're trying to achieve so long as the method, the ways that we're going about achieving it, um, it actually is built on diversity, centers equity in the community, centers the voices of people living in that community. And so, yeah, City Thread, you know, we, we obviously, um, to come back to the first question, why are we called City Thread and not sort of like Bikes Are Us? And part of it is because we actually think that the connections are actually the most important, Peter, are, are the people that are actually there. When people come together to work towards uh, a shared common goal, great things happen. We just want to be a, a part of helping make great things happen. If that happens to be, you know, a new trail in a community, if that happens to be, you know, pop-up parks, if it happens to be uh, farmer's markets, uh, we think the underlying fundamental strategy for getting there is the same. And that's that's something that will be consistent about sort of City Thread's work is that that, that underlies the philosophy of how we how we go about working and engaging with communities. Um, we're just hopeful to see communities achieve the things that they think are going to be amazing for them and for their residents. Cool. That's great to hear. Zoe, from a, a perspective of uh, you know, communities that are, are interested in, in moving forward or getting something done, um, any advice as to how they can, you know, maybe do some fundraising or find, you know, uh, you know, potential funders or uh, you've been in this game a long time of, of connecting, uh, you know, potential uh, philanthropic uh, organizations to, uh, you know, goals and missions. I any any advice that you would have? Uh, oh, so many things come to mind, John. So I guess I would. Um, for sure, center some things that both of my colleagues have alluded to, which is that your best partners are the people that kind of you know in the community and the people that you don't know that might have a shared, you know, with whom you might be able to create a shared vision that's centered around sort of the values and the vision you have for your community, even if your ostensible mission statement of what you work on maybe doesn't exactly align. So, really thinking expansively about what you're trying to create and going back to that most basic vision and then seeing who you can partner with on the ground that could um, work with you on that, I think is a good first step because um, for sure funders are always interested in those collaborations, in um, those partnerships uh, and kind of seeing diverse groups with different kind of areas of expertise kind of coming together around something is, is super important. And I think there are so many ways in which you can say, okay, in our example, I'm a driver, I'm never going to ride a bike, but I want safe streets for my kids to ride bikes, to play on. I want uh, safe uh, streets through my neighborhood so we can all feel comfortable, you know, um, walking and, and playing, you know, basketball, like in the cul-de-sac or whatever, Um we all have that shared interest. So so that's number one is like kind of look expansively uh, across your network and your network's network to see who you might partner with. Um, and then um, also, you know, uh, think 
really carefully about how your work might um, affect other issues that are, are really important kind of in the community and how they connect to that. You know, mobility connects to affordable housing, connects to climate issues, connects to um, uh, food deserts. All those things are linked together. And so that helps you with that network and also helps create a um, an argument for funding that can be really compelling to um, to philanthropy. And I would say, you know, re- you know, find out who are the funders and especially community foundations have a really strong role to play in making those connections and identifying what's happening on the ground and supporting it. Yeah. So, Sarah, you have a, a bit of experience in engaging um, populations that typically haven't been, you know, at the table. Any sage advice that you would have uh, in that area? Because that's a big part of, uh, you know, this whole concept of making sure that you have uh, a diversity of partners and, and across uh, the, the different uh, community populations that are, uh, you know, going to be impacted by that farmer's market or that protected bike lane? First off, if there are certain communities or identities not at your table, those communities and identities are definitely at a table, right? Um, There's amazing things that happen across our cities um, that just happen um, not as collaboratively due to, you know, a variety of reasons and barriers. And so I think it is trying to, really figure out how to humbly and respectfully um, engage and introduce um, yourself as a human being to another human being and identify ways that um, a shared goal can be created, that that a farmer's market can, you know, benefit, um, you know, my wine club, as well as the organization that is helping to get food on people's table that can't afford it, to the organization that is hoping to, um, you know, increase the economic development opportunities on their city's main street. So I think that it really is just looking at the community as a whole and also acknowledging that, you know, people are organizing um, and they can combine that organizing power um, to a larger goal. Yeah. It really reminds me, too, of uh, during the Evolve. uh, Did I get the name right? Evolve? No. The bike share in Memphis. Explore. Explore. (laughs) Really reminds me of the uh, Explore bike share rollout and the the wonderful connections, especially on the, the south side there in Memphis, of the um, the community garden and the fact that there was a station right there at the community garden and the uh, the station that was over at the grocery um, part of the the works uh, organization that was there uh, it, it's great example of of like finding the you know the ability and some commonality across very very diverse populations and and groups and uh and and understanding well you know what what is what is that sort of common thing that is that resonates with everybody and uh, arguably one would say health and well-being and (laughs) so excellent that example for explore bike share is great i think it's even better because those stations didn't show up one day and the idea of a nonprofit bike share system in Memphis happened because, you know, over a year of conversations with residents around, do we want to do this thing um, with the openness that maybe bike share doesn't need to be in Memphis. And, you know, in New Orleans, you know, it wasn't just the mayor. It wasn't just one single organization that decided a complete mobility network was right for New Orleans. It was a variety of community groups that were transit, economy, public health oriented that sort of came up with with the idea. And so I think that's also important um, not to impose your vision or your, um, you know, what you think a community should look like on to a community. Which is the exactly which is exactly the the point of you know that engagement and really uh, making sure that those uh, parties are at the table and and participating in that decision as to yeah do we even want this is this do we want you know <laughs> this uh, uh, the this uh, farmers market etc yeah 
Fantastic. So you, you had, and I was going to say, do we have you noticed a theme here, John, that yeah. it's really about um, working across all the people in your community, all, you know, the networks upon networks, the the other organizations working towards something that's aligned, but not exactly the same. And it works for creating that shared vision. It works for um, building what you want to build. It works for having a more effective uh, case to be made for support from philanthropic organizations. It creates that sustainability in terms of the the ongoing nature of what you're creating that, that Kyle talked about. I mean, all of this like that is why we're city thread. People are the fabric of our communities. And until you're engaging and actively connecting people and connecting with people and elevating their voices to create what they want, you know, that is what a community is, right? That's what we're trying to help with. Right. Yeah. Stitching together the fabric of the, of your communities. <laughs> Fantastic. Kyle, you get the last word here. What have we missed? What would you uh, say that we need to uh, uh, leave the audience with that kind of stitches this all together? Pardon the pun. I, yeah, I, I, I think a lot of what we've discussed is around sort of like, what do you do in order to, to accomplish something, right? And, and sort of like, how, what kind of communications do you need? What kind of organization do you need? Who leads it? Where, where do you need resources? I, I think I would just end this by saying that the, that the thing that you actually do is as important as how you actually get it done. It's uh, the, the network that you build or the project that you build or the thing that you accomplish is as much a communications tool as a billboard hanging on on the side of a building, or, or, or a billboard, or a bus wrap, you know, driving by, uh, you know, a neighborhood ten times a day, the, the communications doesn't end with just being a good messenger, having a great logo, or a catchphrase, or a great website for people to go, because fundamentally, at the end of the day, this is about building momentum and building trust in something. And the outcome of that process has to be believed by all of the partners, has to be believed by people who are, who are now sort of experiencing this. And oftentimes where we see sometimes cities really fail is that they deliver a project that's a little bit watered down than the original version, that doesn't quite achieve the goals that they said it was going to, right? If we're going to build a bicycle lane because we're going to get more people bicycling, but that bicycle lane isn't, isn't protected. It kind of dumps you out into a really busy intersection and then no one rides it um, as a result. It's really hard to convince people the next time around that the next bike lane is going to do that same exact thing. And so communications is, a, is an ongoing process and communities have to remember that it's not just about having great graphics uh, it's not just about sort of, you know, getting your tagline into people's mouths, but the the product of your work um, is just as important as, as how you got there. And that's how you sustain momentum um, into the future. Reminds me of some conversations that you and I had uh, several years ago about storytelling. <laughs> and so uh, the ability to to do some storytelling, the ability to uh, to celebrate the wins that you have out there and uh, to your point is making sure that the thing that is uh, being pushed through is is also something that really resonates and 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 sends that message that this is successful. This was worth the, the trouble. This was worth the investment. City Thread. I love it. You guys, I, I am so excited for you to, you know, launch this uh, new organization. Um, you you are out on Twitter. Uh, so folks, uh, get on over to Twitter, uh, find City Thread, uh, the, the org. So it's City Thread Org. And then, of course, the, the website is CityThread.org. And uh, it's been such an absolute uh, pleasure having you uh, here to help launch City Thread out on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. This was great. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode about City Thread with Sarah, Zoe, and Kyle. Uh, and if you did, 
be sure to give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below. And uh, if you haven't already done so, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just be sure to hit the subscription button and uh, ring that notification bell right next to it so you can customize your notification preferences. And a quick reminder, uh, be sure to pop on over to the Active Town store to see some of the fun Streets of for People swag that I have out there. And also please consider supporting me out on Patreon. Uh, every little bit helps and I really do appreciate it. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.